welcome everybody. Um, our partners, clients, peers, friends, old and new friends, welcome to our session. Um, today we bring to you the India chapter to PhD's predestination. So predestination is um, our this year's big event, our big topic. So I'd love to bring to you in Mumbai today via the Z-Melt um, um, activities and um, the event, um, our, our own session of Predestination PhD. Now, PhD is a media planning and buying agency. We're passionate about thinking, having a point of view about numbers, about data, but more importantly, about having a point of view on some of the innovative things that's happening in our marketing industry right now. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Jyoti. Jyoti Basno, who is our MD of PhD India, and she will introduce what predestination is. Enjoy, everyone. Thank you, Susanna. A very warm welcome to all of you as we take a glimpse into the future of what we as marketeers and media professionals are going to see unfolding before us in the next 10 to 15 years. A lot of what takes place in the next 30 years is actually already in motion. And to connect and engage with a lot of these uh, new audiences and consumers that we are going to uh, encounter in a meaningful and relevant way, our content and our media will have to understand and embrace these inevitable forces. As artificial intelligence becomes ubiquitous, sweeping changes are going to happen and the destination is almost predestined. It is going to be thrilling, it is going to be confusing, it is going to be disruptive, but it is all going to be very, very exciting and it's going to challenge us in ways that we ourselves have not thought possible. So PhD partnered with Kevin Kelly, who is the visionary Wired founder and author, and brought to, brought to Cannes last year Predestination, which explores 12 technological forces that are shaping the future of marketing. These trends, whether it is AI, whether it is machine learning, ubiquitous tracking, uh, robots turning uh, almost human, it's, it's all happening here and now, and they're changing the way we are going to do our business. The only way that we can remain on top of all of this is by accepting and embracing this openly, understanding how they are likely to impact our business, and then going on with doing the right things as we prepare for the next 10 to 15 years. Predestination explores the marketing implications of this. Some of it will raise your eyebrows, some of it may stir a lot of debate, but it will open your eyes to many things which we till now thought were probably not possible. And that is exactly the point. So here is a video which takes a peek into this future. It's hard to imagine our world without artificial intelligence, a technology now evolving around us at an exponential rate. Yet we lived in that world not so long ago. Back in 2016, we were marveling at the speed of change. How slow we would consider that change now. It was 1936 when Alan Turing developed his hypothetical computing machine, and 1943 that saw a computational model for neural networks developed based on algorithms. By 2011, Apple had integrated Siri into their iPhone, Google released Google Now, and tech giants began to meaningfully explore the potential of AI. Soon, Skype became capable of translating between languages in near real time. Objects were listening to what we were saying. And AI was listening to our machines. Washing machines assessing detergent quality. Cars judging petrol efficiency. And homes managing their own energy usage. An abundance of real-time data, marking a new era of preemptive marketing. 2020 was the year that the self-driving car became commercially available. It was also the year objects, social networks and smartphones were producing so much data that ad bidding was conducted in real time by artificial intelligence. 2020 was also the year our virtual personal assistants became sentient-like and began editing the world for us. They understood everything. Every ingredient, every location, every price, every possible way of booking, cancelling and amending. 
AI understood our intentions, often before we did. We spoke naturally to them, and they back to us. They understood and communicated on our behalf to other VPAs. Two algorithms making all the necessary arrangements. Our VPAs now recommended products and experiences. A simple yes from us, and they scheduled and made the booking. For the big media agencies, algorithm speed became the final competitive advantage. By 2023, we had outsourced our decision-making to our artificially intelligent VPAs, which now made purchase decisions on our behalf. They bought when they knew we were running out. They changed brand when they realized our preference had changed. If we'd been told in 2016 that in less than 10 years, marketers would be advertising to machines to persuade them to buy their products, we'd have found it hard to imagine. By now, the job of marketers was to convince machines to buy. Brands sought the best human reviews to convince algorithms to purchase their products and services. Which brings us to 2029. Machines have human levels of intelligence. They tell us jokes. They flirt. Our machines are microscopic and implantable. The first company founded and run by an AI has been established. Soon, artificial intelligence will explore the boundaries of art and music, and an algorithm will win a Grand Prix at Cannes. In little more than a decade from now, AI will be advancing so rapidly that our ability to make predictions will break down. So these are the trends that Kevin Kelly talks about in his book, The Inevitable, which will shape our future. So as we become people of the screen, as we share, we interact, we track, we filter, we remix. What is going to happen is that we are going to see the beginning of a new beginning, and we are really just at the tip of the iceberg. For all of us here and for our industry, it means many exciting possibilities, many opportunities, and I think we are right here at the cusp of a completely exciting phase in the history of uh, humankind to really take advantage of it. I think our children are probably going to envy us that we are at this stage and witnessing this dynamic change. And only communications and media that understands this is going to be able to engage meaningfully with our, with our customers and our clients need to be really ready for this. And where is India in all this? We are getting ready, we are accelerating, the pace is really speeding up. And what we need to do is to seize the opportunity, act now, and make ourselves ready for it, because what is emerging is a world which is truly a blend of technology, creativity, and science. And what, what more could we ask for as professionals to be living our lives and careers in? Nine hours a day already on screens, that's what Indians are doing, and it's increasing, because very soon we are going to have screens on almost every watchable surface. 75% of Indians are open to sharing data, and you know that's higher than what you see here as a worldwide statistic. 63% are fine if brands use it to make their interactions more meaningful. How, how can we navigate this? We need to shift focus from branded ideas to where scalability means millions of personalized messages being delivered. Artificial intelligence is beginning to happen. We hear a lot of stories, and most of them are scare stories, about robots taking away our jobs. All of us hear it, all of us think about it, but this may not all be hype, but this is not really about fear. It's actually about opportunity, and it's about transformation. The CMOs believe it, our panelists here believe it, and they're going to talk a little bit later about how they are readying their businesses for this. What we're going to witness is a transformation, and by 2020, I think they, the, the statistics say, the projections say that there will be 20. 8 billion things connected to the internet. So to put that in pers perspective for you, that's literally three connected devices for every single person on this planet. And about 10 to 15% of those things are going to actually come from India as per the current projections. Right now, we are a tiny little speck in this horizon, but by 2020, India is really going to be ready for this. These are the four trends that our panel will explore today. We are, what we are talking about here is really the interconnection of artificial intelligence, data, personalization, and creativity, and how they are colliding to create opportunities for us to take advantage of. Take X, add AI. That's literally what cognifying is. Everything can be made interesting, new, more valuable by adding online smartness to it.
The idea of cognifying is that we're making things smarter. We are taking dumb things and making them have a little bit of intelligence, and we're taking smart things and making them even smarter. This intelligence is not really human-like. It's not at all like us. It's an alien intelligence, but it's artificial learning and artificial smartness that we can consume and employ almost like it was electricity. So anywhere electricity goes, this AI, this artificial smartness will go, and we can use it to make new things. So we'll take anything X and we'll add AI to it, and that is going to be the formula for the next 10,000 startups. Whatever business you're in, you're now in a data business. Whether you're in agriculture, transportation, media, of course, you're now dealing with bits. And those bits are flowing. And all this information about the data is itself creating new data about itself. So the information about your customers is almost as valuable as your customers themselves. And we are moving all these things towards this eternal constant flow of becoming. We are at the moment where we are just completely flooded by options and opportunities. Every year there's 60 million new songs created, there's innumerable books. We have to figure out some way to filter all that good stuff. And we have to find ways to personalize it so that we are only dealing with the stuff that is right for us. What we all want is to be treated as individuals, to be treated personally rather than as a generic number. And that requires great amounts of filtering and technologies that will distinguish and discriminate in our favor. That technology doesn't really exist right now, but that is a major frontier in the coming 20 years. And being able to do that will be extremely valuable to those who know how, because it is the only way that we are going to be able to enjoy the abundance that we have coming and remixing. This is our take on it. Unbundle and productively recombine. Every single one of us today has the power to mix and remix and create new things and create new media. And I think what it's doing is creating interesting collisions and combinations of new, better, maybe uncharted, exciting nonetheless. More on this from our panel. Uh, and it is my immense pleasure and honor to introduce to you Arnab Goswami, Raghav Behel, and Samir Bangara. They don't even need any introduction. I would like to welcome them on stage. And Kel Hook, who is the PhD APAC Global Account Management Lead, is going to moderate this discussion. So please welcome on stage Arnab, Raghav, and Samir. Uh, I'd like to start, I guess, with just a, a very probably general question to, to each of you um, to answer that. You know, Jyoti sort of spoke about four key themes that we we're exploring today, cognifying, flowing, filtering, remixing. And if you're just thinking about each of your own businesses, of those four, which are the ones that are you sort of really focusing on at the moment and for your business today, but also how will, will, will you also have focus shifting to some of the other themes or the, those four themes over the next two to three years? Um, so start with Raghav. Well, thanks, uh, Kel. Um, you know, I, I'd rather not pick on just yeah. one of those verticals because uh, I think there's a, there are interconnections yeah. in, in all of them. Very much so. Uh, what has become very clear to me in the last three years that I've done the switch from what I can now call old media <laughs> to, to new media is really big data. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think what we, uh, you know, in the legacy world, in the linear world, uh, it was almost at what, what we used to love to say is we live in a world of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. you remember that phrase used to be in business school, in journalism school, every school we used to be taught how we are living in the age of uncertainty and therefore you have the unknowns that you need to deal with and audiences are unknown and what kind, what is exciting them is unknown. So you, have, you are living in a world where you make, need to make intelligent guesstimates. That has completely changed I believe now to a world of over certainty. Mm -hmm. We seem to know too much. Uh, and that has its own sort of uh, flow back. So for me, the, uh, the, the critical thing is that every nanosecond, each human being 
uh, who's digitally connected is throwing up data. A lot of that data is relevant. Uh, what I'm reading, who I'm following, what I'm reacting to, what comment I'm posting, what I'm buying, where I'm traveling, which hotel I'm staying mm -hmm. in, what am I doing right now? It's on Facebook, it's perhaps on Twitter. So there are, if all of these are data points. And sometimes I wonder, and I, you know, I wonder whether um, that has been thought through by, by people like you, what's going to happen to server farms? Mm -hmm. they, they sort of run over this world, right? I mean, there's so much data. There's yeah. terabytes and terabytes of data, and all of this is indestructible. It's all being, uh, uh, being put in somewhere. So for me, that's the big thing. The fact that we are now living in a world of big data, uh, everything is a data point, mm -hmm. uh, and we run the risk of making decisions based on over-certainty, therefore getting trapped in echo chambers. I'm sure okay. we'll talk about yes. that. Yes, yeah, we will. I'm not... I've been denied a mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the moment you start depending on machines to think for you, then we are finished. I believe in disruption of the mind. What you can do is that you can use technology to get all the rudimentary stuff done. But media is not washing clothes especially in the news media, you can run a vacuum cleaner using artificial intelligence, but you can't use a content, run a content organization solely using artificial intelligence. The disruption of the medium does not become the disruption of the message. People want to stop thinking. Mm -hmm. And then when people want to stop thinking, they say, oh, I have a nice phone, it will think for me. So I will win because I have better technology. Better technology does not make you win because the best technology is up here in your brain. If you don't use the technology up here and you start depending on terabytes and gigabytes and technology and complicated words to, to convince yourself that you will win, then history is replete in the content business you cannot win using only technology. Point one. Point two this machine up here helps me to filter. So you asked which of the four do matters the most. So I'll give you a simple example. We said when we launched Times, uh, we left Times now, we went to Republic. Mm -hmm. And at Fiki Frames I said uh, that it is a David versus Goliath fight. And people asked me, how are you so confident that you will defeat a hundred year old or whatever, centuries old organization? And we said, because we are the Davids, we think. So come and outthink me. When we said outthink, we basically were talking about our ability to filter. There will be a thousand stories, Raghav. A machine can never tell you which ten stories people will listen to. And if you start depending on a machine to tell you what ten stories people will listen to, you will lose. Mm -hmm. We sit and we think of what people will relate to. So it is an understanding of sociology social psychology, politics, this country, the world we live in, and the people. A machine can never think of these things because all of these things are inherently subjective. So for me, and I'll keep it short at the start, because anyway, this is the le length of my average mm. question. <laughs> I have been warned. I, I'll stop. I, I thought I was asking a question. I, I, <laughs> this is the, I never give answers. I give answers to my own questions. <laughs> but for me, the most critical thing is and that at 5 o'clock today, when you switch on Republic TV, what will you find which you will not find on XYZ channel? And it is me and my team of people who have to sit and passionately think about what matters. That is what I call being wired in the true sense. Mm -hmm. At the same time, one small word of caution. I use technology a lot. That does not limit the role of the content creator. So we use technology to magnify, right? Or to accentuate, or to underline what is important. But we will never depend on technology to take the decisions. Okay. Thank you. I think that opens up a point that we'll discuss later about what are the type of roles and, and capabilities that we need to sort of think about. But sure. Samir, I think... Um, I'm, I'm glad we started this way because yeah. uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with what Arnab said. I mean, we, we run a, a media company that's backed with tech. 
And the fundamental question that, uh, you know, oftentimes investors will pose to you is, are you a tech company or are you a content company? Yeah. Tech almost is the, uh, is the stunt man mm -hmm. to the content that's the hero. And that's typically what we go out with. Uh, you, you take out the technology layer and there are many facets of our business that will begin to crumble. But it clearly is not the hero, which is the content. And, uh, and very often, uh, uh, my two co-founders of far more illustrious people uh, than I am, Shekhar Kapoor and Yair Rahman, all amount of Google Analytics, all amount of uh, you know, analytics that we might run in something, and then we filter five videos to them, and in a blink of an eye, and there's a book written about this, I'm sure many of you have read it, Blink, they're able to pick something in, in content or in a creator that, uh, that is just you know, months ahead of what analytics might be able to predict. So I think the human interface is the smartest interface and uh, sacrificing that to tech is, uh, is not the question. But, but I, neither do I think that in the context of what we're saying that that's what we were alluding to. Mm -hmm. I think from a marketing perspective, there's a lot of uh, interesting things that one can do uh, using AI or machine learning, which is a subset of that, uh, to market better. Uh, I mean, in the advertising world, real-time buying, uh, where you know, or programmatic buying, is uh, today probably runs uh, out of the 10,000 crores spent on digital, probably three, four thousand crores is driven through programmatic, which is all it's 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 automated buying. So I think there's a value to that, but that is different from content offerings. Yeah. Uh, so I think for uh, and in you know, Arnab's point is uh, well taken in, in the medium that they're operating in. It's absolutely about him and his team. In the medium where we are trying to address niches and make niches into mass, I think we are leveraging certain trends that we can pick up to identify an early niche and, and see how we can actually find audiences for that. So we run a video network. The video network uses a lot of the flowing aspect. It's all about data. Because it's about data, we're able to cognify it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sort of make, make it smarter and then filter it to personalize it to people who might be interested in that. XYZ watch this, therefore they might like that and Amazon's been doing it for years. So that aspect is not new, but how do you get better and better at doing that? Mm -hmm. So the, the flowing aspect, absolutely in the video network, then cognifying it and filtering it and then the creators themselves, we, we are the largest music network, we have some of the, the biggest digital influencers in music. And they're the ones who are taking this whole remixing aspect. And I think music is perhaps the best analogy of how you can actually take, you know, a 60s song and, and, and sort of remodel it today's sound and make it a massive hit. And Bollywood's doing it uh, after the digital babies have done it. So I think all those four aspects are very, very central to, uh, to our business, which is, which is a digital business at heart. But then we take that and we figure out once something is scaled in digital, how do we take it to offline mm -hmm. and create offline properties, the online to offline phenomenon. So I think... Obviously, you know, from the, 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 the starting conversation, all of these points are interconnected. And I just want to pick up something um, that Arnab said about the human connection. There's that side of it on, I guess, how we sort of think about what our audiences want. But if you think about, I think, the, the immense changes that are happening in India, you know, it is that, and that all of a sudden, you know, like the, the increases in digital population and that you know, all of a sudden, I think through, you know, well, some of the changes that have happened probably over the last 18 months, that you have a shift from digital audience being perceived as just simply an urban population to actually being urban rural. So it's become you know, almost a sort of democratizing digital and access to that. The question I think I'd like to get your perspective on is then, how do you sort of think about your audiences? And because we're, you know, the old models, you know, um, Raghav, you sort of, you know, you've come from an old media, you know, Arnab, you're sort of saying you're moving from a very sort of traditional media organisation into the digital space. How do you now think about your audiences and connecting with those audiences? Are we, at a, you know, are we we're moving from a point where it's no longer about simply pushing out things to mass audiences, but the idea of that filtering and personalisation? What are your, what are your sort of insights about why that's important? How you apply it to your business? and also the scale of that, because our businesses are actually also about how do we scale to our audiences and the potential for that in India. Uh, what technology has given us is uh, an infinitely sharper tool now to understand our audiences than what the case mm -hmm. was earlier. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, in, in the good old days where audiences did not have the opportunity to talk back with you, 
that was a linear audience where you used to broadcast to the audience, but the audience had absolutely no way except for writing that cumbersome letter to the editor which would come four days later uh, in snail mail. So now, uh, increasingly, we are in a world of conversations because my audience now has the ability to get back to me. And then I am duty bound to engage with, with, audi with audiences. The point you make about uh, how India is getting digitally connected, uh, you know, uh, India skipped a lot of uh, evolutionary steps. It's not because, linear progression. Yeah, because we, we, we've just come straight uh, uh, to a world which is yeah. very digital, very mobile. Yeah the peak of our demographic sort of dividend or the demographic revolution in this country has coincided with the digital revolution. A lot of our young people, whether urban, whether rural, are growing up with the handheld uh, uh, device, uh, even feature phones which are rich. So uh, you now have a, an audience which is very empowered, unlike the audience in the early 90s or the mid 90s, which had to actually consume what editors were telling them or what content creators were telling them. Now you have an audience which says, yes, I see what you're giving to me, but here is my point of view. Uh, and as any good content creator, you will have to uh, incorporate, respond, evolve along with the conversation with your audience. So that, I think that's the major change. Now within that conversation, you now have the ability to parse, to filter, uh, to ensure that uh, you can target, you can personalize. But I personally am uh, a, I, I'm a bit wary of over-personalizing. Mm -hmm. Because if you over-personalize something, you then run the risk of creating echo chamber. Uh, and one of the great uh, um, requirements of the news content business is not to be trapped in an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. An editor must have the most open mind in the world. Uh, because uh, if you start prejudging, uh, your audience, then you start creating that kind of content. So I think, uh, to me, the cr interface between instinct, judgment, serendipity, and uh, the personalization of my audience gives me the best content point uh, with which to reach out. So uh, if today my audience is, uh, if I'm right now sitting at the editor's desk, and I thought my big story was going to be Yogi Adityanath as, you know, uh, travels to uh, Ajodhya and UP, and suddenly a big story breaks. Ramchandra Guha has resigned as uh, the BCCI cricket administrator. Uh, and that story gets linked to the Virat Kumble fight. That's a big story. Now, I would be uh, deaf and mute not to respond to it as an editor. What placing I give it, what emphasis I give it, what ranking I give it is a matter of judgment, is a matter of instinct. Uh, but to ignore it, I don't believe I would like to ignore it. Uh, because I think that's the conversation that you like to have with okay. an audience. I know all these complicated words are making me confused. <laughs> you know, <laughs> for me it's all very simple. You understand the mind of the people watching it. That's all. Problem in media in India is that we have started chasing our own tail. The print media is insecure today. It doesn't know what the future is. Wherever you go, people say print is dying. So the print journalists are also insecure. They start looking at TV. The TV guys start looking at breaking news and then they in turn look at digital. The digital guys are looking at Froll and 10 other ways of measuring Twitter indices and they are trying to find out what people are talking about. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the people who are talking about things are again looking at others talking about what. So sometimes what's happening is, think about it, the entire media is basically chasing its own tail. Everybody eventually is trying to follow what the other person is talking about. What happens in all of this? There is nothing original left. Everybody is talking about everybody else. Which is why if you look at media today, you look at digital media and digital news media, they only talk about other media. What Raghav said about an echo chamber is correct, Raghav. But Raghav, the media is in its own echo chamber. It's chasing the tail. That's why in television and me, how many exclusive stories come up today? How much original reporting happens? How many original reporting stories do you see? Why is it that the original reporting that we are capable of is not happening? Because eventually if you are going to look for Twitter to decide what news story happens, you are going to be chasing your own tail and Raghav, I politely disagree completely with your assessment that the role of the journalist is only to look at the stack that you have and then decide is what is four and what is one and what is two. That's not the role of the editor. 
the role of the editor is to disrupt, to break the whole damn thing and to question the flow. Why is it that the entire Indian media kept quiet about how Sunanda Pushkar was killed? Mm -hmm. Because they're all chasing their own tail. They're trying to see, is anyone else reporting it? Oh, if I report it, I'll get into trouble. Huh? Shashi Tharoor will file a case against me. So I won't follow it either. And hence, everybody is following their own tail. We need disruption in the media. Disruption will come from content. In the last five years, that digital media has existed in India, it is most unfortunate that original content creation is not happening in the digital medium. How is it possible that you have so many so-called digital journalists in India and not one big news story has ever been broken by a digital news source? It's, a thing, it's, a, it's a something that we must now look within and ask ourselves. Is it because the digital media are only looking at Twitter to decide what to pick up on? Is it because videos are being duplicated? Is it because the smartest thing that some digital producer thinks they can do is take a video and rehash it? Mm -hmm. Are we making the process of journalism simple when it should be much more advanced? The time has come for us today. We have the tools. Use the tools, but go back to the core principle of journalism. Use the tools, but don't forget the core of what the reporting and news media business mm -hmm. is. And I can only talk about news media. And that's what we are hoping to do. So I think this, again, I'm making the same point. Don't over depend on technology. A point will come when you will stop, like you stop remembering phone numbers on your phones, you'll stop remembering how to ask a question to a person. That's actually happening right now. We can't become brain dead in the content business mm -hmm. and we can't allow technology to take us to that point. We need to break away from that. Every morning we need to wake up and say, we will use technology but not depend on it. Not depend on it. Okay. That's my view. So, again, I think very passionate sort of um, discourse. If I could maybe just sort of um, from what you were just sort of saying, help sort of, or put it into a bit of, I guess, a context for our market or your audiences. You're talking about, you know, what the news media must do, what journalists do. That, but it almost starts, and it starts from a point of authenticity. But then is that, you know, but to me, is that then the same message that to potential brands and marketers, it's very important that you have Gil, that... May I, just before yeah. we... Uh, can I, we'll, can we'll, I give we'll, a 30, we'll second, 30 second answer to that? 30 second, I'll stop okay, at 30 yeah. seconds. Why did BBC die? Why did BBC die? And why did Vice come up? Because BBC reached, reached the same point where it took its position for granted and started analyzing the news rather than reporting it. Vice went and actually reported where the ISIS terrorists were, captured them on camera. They created original content. A point comes in the inflection point of any media organization and any media business when you begin to forget your core. Mm -hmm. The reason why BBC died and CNN is going to die is because they've forgotten the core. And that's where new organizations come to. So it, it establishes the point I make is, the smart guys are the ones who use technology and go back to the core, which is content creation. Whereas BBC, all it will do is take the same video and try and replicate it using technology, and that is why they will perish. Okay, I think we could hear from some Yeah, yeah, your, your because, around yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think, um, I can't refute Arnab's point or, or Raghav's point because they obviously understand the news business. Yeah. When, you, when you hit the digital landscape, uh, news is a uh, significant part and people like Vice have made news a, a much bigger part of content consumption. But outside of that, from an Indian context on digital, news is, uh, is, a, is a small part and TV is the lion's share of that. And which is why, you know, uh, the first port of call for Arnab while launching Republic would have been TV first and not necessarily a pure digital play. Having said that, when you hit digital, you're actually hitting inbound medium. When you're on TV, you've got your distribution and you've got your outdoor and there is a massive push and it's, a, it's sort of prime time viewing. On digital, it's 24 hours of prime time to borrow from you know, what Raghav said a couple of years ago at, the, at this conference. Now the point here is, if it is inbound, there is no way in hell that you will make a dent on consumption if the content isn't original or interesting yeah. or interestingly original. Now, what we've tried to, how does one hack that? If you have an organization with a creative head who's deciding what to put out, you're limited by the, the creativity of that one person or the team of five people. What we try to do is open that up to hundreds of creators on a daily basis and how do you, and then use the tool, again, going back to using the technology as a lever, not the hero and not put out that content to fix and help them create content. So a simple example, how do you create videos far cheaper? 
you know, a smartphone is a basic example of that. But if anybody of you used a, a very popular app that's, uh, that's 100 million people internationally and hitting India now at a million plus, is an app called Musical.ly. And if you have cousins or kids who are under 18, they're most likely on Musical.ly. What Musical.ly has done is what Instagram did to photographs. It made an average photographer look cool, and Musical.ly has done that a video. Now the point is, that's, that's the beauty of it. The content is original, and it's a lot of remixing happening there. So I think the point I, I wanted to make is there's a lot of digital content creation that is happening on a daily basis, uh, certainly in, in the genres of music, in genres of comedy. The second thing that we've seen is, we all noticed the growth of how brands became publishers. And we've talked about this trend for, you know, from 15 years ago, brands becoming publishers. And people, you know, you, you've heard to death the example of Red Bull and, uh, and, and Dove and Johnson & Johnson. What's happening now is that there is a creator revolution and we've seen the emergence of a digital superstar. Uh, you know, you call it PewDiePie in the States who's twice the size of Disney, Coke and Pepsi combined. One creator, twice the size of Disney, Coke and Pepsi combined. So the creator, has become the brand, i.e. the publisher. Now, how do you leverage that to segue and come sort of left of field from a marketing perspective to communicate with audiences? And the tragedy for me today is out of the 10,000 crore digital spend, there's a paltry, absolute, you know, shameful 125 crores that was spent on true content marketing versus 4,000 crores went on deploying across can I, technology. Can I add one, 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 one question I have here. Is, Am I allowed to ask questions? <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take a one sentence question. How is it, okay, this is a 14-word, one-sentence yeah. question. How is it that almost all the original content that has been created on video in the last four or five years in India, in a country where bandwidth is growing, 90% of the original content creation is in the comedy genre? I mean, are we a country of comedians? It's not, Arnab. No. It's not, Arnab. No, it is. I, Principally, it is. Or no, it's, it's a rehash of Bollywood and stuff. It's not. So, uh, actually, the music genre, X music label, is three times the size of comedy. And we, we, we took great efforts to explain this to, uh, to, the, uh, to the, the folks who run the platforms, that comedy stood out and it becomes viral. It, it tends to hit us up in our echo chambers of Facebook and Twitter. However, in terms of real consumption, it is one-fourth the size okay, of music. So I concede your point, it's music and comedy. So are we a country of musicians and comedians? Uh, uh, there's nothing, no, no, no shame in why, that. In, in, that means we're not creating original no, content. No, so there's, there's several other genres. In fact, so dance as a genre, by the way, has emerged now. So we're a country of dancers and musicians and comedians. And chefs, yes. Um, yes, if I can, if no, no, that's a, entertainment. Okay, we'll stop. If I could just interject. Because people think, are consuming that, no, right? Just, Sameh, people, if I could just interject. I think we are providing I, I, entertainment to them. I think, right I think the actual the point is, <laughs> we, you know, we, we could get into the, the uh, I guess, the pros and cons of different genres, but I think it's actually what, the, what this digital revolution is sort of enabling for people is to actually, the idea of filtering, which is to find the content that they're looking for at any given moment based on their own needs. And, you know, and that content will usually fall into one of sort of three buckets. You know, it's either going to be entertaining for me, it's either going to be useful for me in some way, or it's going to help inform me. That's the sort of, you know, I think listening to the conversation, we've got you know, two, you know, two of you are coming from a new sort of background which is much more informing. You're coming from a creative, creative content which is much more entertaining. But I think it's also a key point for a lot of marketers who are still very much, I think, focused on, I have this one message that I'm going to push out across every channel that I have possible to actually then, without any sort of sense of what is, what is my consumer thinking at that time? What do they actually really need? What's going to be useful for them? What's the context of that? And now that I think we're in a time where digital is actually enabling us to think about that. You know, so from how people consume you know, news in the morning to during the day to the evening is how you are setting your content, how your, the type of content your creators are creating is based on those needs, needs of people. Would you all agree with that as a, as a, as a starting point for moving on? I just wanted to uh, yeah. add something to what uh, Samir had talked about, the, uh, the fact that brands are becoming publishers. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that's a, a, a okay, big... I was saying the creators are now becoming yeah. publishers because the yeah. creators have become brands. So the brands became publishers a while back. Okay. Now okay. the so creators be have become the brands, i.e. now the publishers. Okay. Because otherwise, uh, you know, there is also a reverse trend which is now happening, which is that the publishing platforms, uh, by virtue of the fact that they are independent, mm -hmm. arm's length, uh, and they carry credibility, I mean, that's, those are the calling cards of any uh, publisher, uh, 
in, in any area, news, non-news, uh, those calling cards are now getting a premium. And therefore, if you want to push your content, you have to pass the filters uh, of these publishing platforms. Self-publishing uh, is also self-limiting in a way, uh, because you are again going to be uh, confined to people who follow you, who like you, or are willing to suspend the fact, uh, suspend the belief that this is not independent. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think th th we are seeing that we are seeing publishers, independent publishers, beginning to get heft back on digital, which they had lost about four years ago because they they were sort of stunned by this revolution that every human being with a phone is a publisher. You know, uh, and it yeah. took took a while to get back with uh, strategies there. Yeah, but I think it was a point that um, Anna, we were talking yesterday around that what people are loyal, look, people are loyal to the content the loyalty to the content. So it's also the quality of the content is also very important as well. So that's, I think, starts to sift out now the idea that, well, we have an audience here, each equipped with this device could go and create anything possible that just because you can do that doesn't actually automatically guarantee you success. It's the quality, it's that human, you know, interaction, it's that, you know, that, that spark, that idea that is still really important. Yeah. You see, the what the point, the focus is to be pull. Yeah. It can't be push. Yes. So in the old media, what you saw was push. You will read my newspaper because I will make sure that the person delivering the newspaper to your house force feeds you the newspaper. It doesn't matter what newspaper you like, but that fellow will reach you at seven o'clock, and I will block anybody else from delivering a paper to your house. So it's like a mafia business. You cover a territory. That was the way legacy mm -hmm. media, the real legacy media, Raghav, not you and me. The real legacy media used to operate. <laughs> now it's got to be pull. My contention on pull is that from my understanding, and Raghav will understand it better, he's been longer in the business than I have, is that it's got to be a mix of two things. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. When Raghav started uh, TV18, he started a show called the Amul India Show. It was a damn good show. The content was unique at that point of time, so there was a pull there, but there was also no other show of its kind at that point of time, right? Similarly, The World This Week was a damn good show, but it's not like the content was unique, the look and feel was unique, so it was different because of look and feel, so the pull came out of that. Today, to have pull from the audience is far more complicated, yeah. nuanced, and difficult. Much more. Today, if Raghav goes out and tries to make a, on his upcoming TV channel, an Amul India show, it will be much more difficult for him to get the same pull from the audience. So, your pull will have to be genuinely a greater effort by the content creators. The pull for any content eventually comes from two things in my view. One from the content itself. Is the story good? Are the visuals compelling? Is there something uniquely original? Is the interview good? And sometimes for reasons that I don't understand, people watch the same video again and again. Like I'm told the interview with Rahul Gandhi is watched again and again. I don't know whether for news or entertainment. But the second reason why, besides content, people pull towards a piece of content is because the belief and the trust. So the pull is for a brand as well as for the content. And the brand eventually is a combination of a number of people who believe in one thing. Mm -hmm. I think in all of this content creation business, we sometimes forget our conviction of belief. So I think pull is these two things. It's not just the virality of that specific content. That will work in an area of music, where, for example, somebody sings well, so that video will go viral. But can you produce news like that? You can't. So different areas of content, you'll have to deal with the pull factor differently. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to quickly add to that, I think what, what we are seeing in India is, is super interesting. Just in the last six months, at, at least on digital, we've seen a massive shift in the construct of the consumer base. It's moved from uh, the heroes being driven by urban taste to Indic content. And so if you just look at the YouTube charts, you'll, you'll find that some of the, the, the biggest creators, uh, English, comedy, etc., have been toppled by, uh, by Hindi mm -hmm. kind of content that you might not even want to expose to you know, uh, a, a young child. But, so it started off with Hindi when a lot of the broadcasters had that thrust on YouTube. But uh, it, it then swung to all of this. Now it's back to that. So uh, we've seen a massive shift in that. You've seen incredible growth. I mean, a platform like YouTube growing 200% in the last six, nine months is just stupendous growth. So uh, I think capturing some of that at scale and 
what we are seeing is, uh, and I think we're all saying this in different ways, how do you solve the problem of getting this pull is uh, just like you use crowdsourcing at scale to create content, but not all of that content is worth watching. And so there is the filtering process that is absolutely required. But uh, what we've seen clearly that's happened is the boundaries between the creator and the consumer have blurred. And that's creating a tsunami of creators coming mm -hmm. on the platform that now need this filtering process. And that's where tech becomes a bit of a friend. Mm -hmm. But like I keep saying, it's not the hero. Now you can put a gatekeeper. It's not an a &R head like mm -hmm. a music company or a programming yeah. head and a broadcaster. But it's, it's, uh, it's democratizing that, that piece by allowing tech to sift through engagement metrics, mm -hmm. watch time completion. So you get real understanding of whether something is actually being consumed. Mm -hmm. And then seeing if you can blow that niche up into mass audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing also in India, every technology prediction has been beaten by 50 to 75 percent. Yeah. And this is because India is beating itself. I'll give you one example. When we understood how much DTH penetration would be in India, everybody said it would be 5 to 10 percent. Today, those numbers have magnified by twice and thrice. I think we underestimate our own ability to accept technology and reject it. Mm. India was the last country the BlackBerry came into. It was the first country where people rejected the BlackBerry. I remember going to New York in 2005 and looking at a shop and asking whether that is a palm top or a mm. Blackberry because we never saw something like that in India. That's 2005. We rejected it before Hong Kong and China did. Yeah. So that's one thing. Second is, you know, when you look at language, one thing is language and urbanization are going together in India. In India today, the urbanization trends are 40 to 50 percent higher than what they were predicted five years back, which means we are, we are urbanizing far quicker. And with the roads we are building, this Nagpur-Mumbai highway will urbanize far quicker. These audiences speak different languages. The real trend is to ask for the number of people not to speak English as a first language, but to speak English as a second language. And there are about 400 million Indians who speak English as a second language. And large number of these people will be urban or urbanized. Therefore, the future is, and these people will be watching a lot of video on their phones. Yeah. So the entire audience behavior is changing much faster than we can imagine. On top of it, one last thing. The person born in 1995 turns 23 next year and therefore becomes the, slowly over the next two or three years, becomes the person taking critical economic decisions mm -hmm. for himself. What media is that person going to you know, consume? The 22-year-old today, by the time he turns 27, India will change completely. And by 2021, 2022, the media landscape of this country, the use of language, the use of technology, everything's going to change. And that's why I said, not for any other thing, I hope that by the time that person is 27, we provide the person something more Absolutely. than music and comedy yep. as original content mm -hmm. on their phones. Yep. I just want to add two, two okay. comments of, uh, to this, uh, which is adding to this. So, Oftentimes, the Indian consumer is considered to be uh, sort of non-savvy. It's the biggest mistake that you can make by saying that. I used, to, I used to run a gaming company before this and you would think, really, gaming? Some of our top gamers, the, uh, there was a practicing pujari in, uh, in a temple in Bihar mm -hmm. who, who was one of our most prolific gamers. Uh, we had Jawans at the, you know, at the Indo Park border who were playing games. And this, this, and this is, I'm talking about really dated information, but at the time that people didn't think gaming was penetrating. Now, as consumers, I think we are some of the most savviest content mm -hmm. consumers in the world. Uh, as gamers, we were more engaged gamers once you were exposed. I think Jyoti shared a statistic that, you know, 75% of, I was a, a little shocked and, and sort of uh, encouraged by that. 75% of Indians are okay sharing personal data and, and, uh, and, and I think 63% will allow you to use mm -hmm. that to serve them advertising. That's 20% internationally. Yeah. We're not so, the, the biggest conspiracy theory here is, in the West, telling people that your privacy is actually your mm -hmm. privacy. There's no such thing, but people don't want to share their data. And over here, I think people are a little bit more open to that, which makes the, the ability for marketeers in the context of what we are here for today, sort of target market better mm -hmm. to them. So I think the Indian consumer is a far savvier consumer than international consumers. And we are growing at a pace uh, last year, I mean, till last year, three years ago, there was, uh, there were, uh, I think, one smartphone for every 10 yeah. phones. Last year, it was six for every 10. And uh, three years out, it'll be six for every one feature phone. So, yes. it'll, so that kind of shift to, to what, you know, what uh, I think Arna was also talking about, you can't program for that. Yeah. You can just, you've got to do that on the fly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and sort of, you know, and that's why I love the space that we're yeah. in. Great. Um, well, look, dudes, I guess it's been a very lively, conversa yes. a lively conversation. Um, I, was, I was forewarned that getting <laughs> such, um, I think, 
I think, strong personalities on the stage, which is also, I think, yeah, great. I got to say a few things. I'm, I'm glad I'm working with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think just to sort of sum up, I think there's sort of three, three key themes that sort of come out of the conversation, if, if you um, will give me the, the pleasure of summing up, that I think when you first started, we're talking about the importance of data. And there is, as marketers, brands, news media, creators, we have access to so much data. But it's important not, I guess, to, to, I think your point was not to be blinded by that data, but to also think about how we actually collect all that data. But then the most important part of that is the human element. The element to actually sort of be able to contextualize that data, to actually go, you know, what data set A plus B doesn't equal C, it can actually equal other things, which is a really important part. I think there was another, a lot of the conversation is also centered around the idea of content. And I think that, you know, from a news, you know, we talk about content in a very broad sense, but everything now that even brands are doing is actually content. We're not in the advertising business anymore. We are actually in the content business. So how do you think about the content that you are putting out there is not just what you think you need to put out there, but how it actually does create that pull with your audience and the different, and the different types of content and context that is needed. And I think the last point is also the, the sense that, um, and I know that India in a, in a market, particularly in a lot of the digital media space, we have, a, we have a issue with, I guess, the measurement and the belief in the numbers. But I think, you know, listening to the three of you up here, I think it's a sense of, this isn't happening in a linear fashion, it's leapfrogging. Um, it is not sort of going from A to B, it is leapfrogging. And that at, at some point, at some point it's, it's no longer a case of waiting to see if digital is going to happen, it is happening, and it's very important now, I think, for agencies, marketers, brands, platforms to actually embrace it, as I think all the three of you are, re are really embracing it and forging that future for India. So um, I'd like to thank you very much um, for you. a very lively debate, and thank the audience for um, a full house. So that's wonderful. Thank you.